We're up, mate. Roman Bonnier. How are you, buddy? Very good. You? I'm good, man. Good to this be is, here. This, yeah, it's good. Dude. It's good. We got a lot of history, man. A lot of history. We're way back now. Yeah. So for those that don't know uh, our history, I guess, we, we turned up to Auburn University on the same day in 1996, didn't we? Exactly. December. Right December. after Christmas. Right after Christmas, man. We turned up to America on the same day. It was you, me, and uh, Lionel Moran. True. Yeah. So you you guys flew in from France. I flew in from Australia. We turned up on the same day. We had no idea that each each of us were coming. I mean, you you and Lionel turned up together, but I didn't know uh, these French guys were coming. You didn't know this Australian guy was coming. We turned up. They put us in a van together. You guys can't speak English very well, and uh, we, we were on a, a trip from Auburn to Florida, 12-hour 12, 12 bus trip, uh, and just trying to – 12-hour van trip and just trying to figure out who each other are, right? Yeah. Uh, just to, as a little reminder, I, huh. I don't wear it very often. This is an old huh. jacket, Auburn Damn, jacket. So That is old. Wow. I found that in my closet well, after you <laughs> called me for this. Uh, I figured it would be a good way for me to wear it after 20 – some years yeah um, and i knew we'd, we'd talk a little bit about those good old stories and yeah. uh but it, it, there's a few things that we we cannot express over the internet and uh <laughs> but I, I can tell the, to the people watching us that uh, your sense of humor was already back in place back then <laughs> and and you enjoyed you, you enjoyed the fact that we could not understand very much at least our understanding was no longer than after after 20 minutes we lost concentration we, we kept answering yes and no to to the questions and, and we realized sometimes it was the wrong answer so we we changed our answer just to uh... <laughs> well we we ended up uh living together and most of your uh uh you know um gauge of the english language came from watching movies most of it was uh friday i remember we watched we watched friday on repeat i was i was actually <laughs> talking i was talking with sergio lopez about this today i was like i got roman bunyan and uh he learned english by watching friday and it, we, we were living in Auburn, alabama and you would repeat words and, and lines that you heard from the movie so i'm like hey Romy, we, we can't say that around here man you can't talk like that you know no, but it, we thought it was like it was a way for us to be uh, to mingle, you know, yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. and for a while it was okay because people couldn't understand us. Although what we said was right, uh, the accent wasn't, <laughs> the way we said it wasn't. So uh, at the end of the day, we got away with most of it until one day we started speaking good enough to uh, mm. to that it became a problem to speak the Friday language. So mm. we had to uh, we had to improve on the also the everyday language. And thanks to you and a few other people. We did not to everybody on the team. People just like making fun of us. I, <laughs> I remember Lionel saying, "Brushing my teeth, my tits every night uh, <laughs> was, ma was making people laugh a lot." Or and, uh, and and a few of our mistakes that was uh, that was good. Like I ate my broccoli's, put an S to things because <laughs> it's what we do in France. <laughs> but it helped us, you know. It actually helped yeah. us uh, uh, yeah. find up find places in in this special place of Auburn. Well, you and I have very, very similar paths in terms of we, we had successful NCA careers. We went on to represent our country at international meets. And then we go on to coach and we're, we're both successful coaches pretty early on. So um, we have very similar paths in terms of from that first day where we turned up to America together and then beyond in terms of where we went. But um, just just your impression of when you when you first turned up, and I, I want to get into all of that, right? Like the whole history. But like when you first turned up to America, we we were kind of the I think we were number the number two team in the country. You and I didn't really know much about college swimming, what that meant. But we turned up. We were the number two team in the country, and at that time, we're about three months out of winning our first national championship as as Auburn University swim team. Like the the history of the program basically started right there when when three months later we go and we win this national championship but like in that three months what what did you figure out about college swimming the first thing i figured out was the the, the meaning of the word team because um when you don't participate into the ncaa you don't understand that you, you the, the belonging to a team 24 7 mm. 
when when you're actually a swimmer, you you're part of a team, but you also you a lot of time you perform for yourself. And at the NCAA level, that that does not really count. And one of the things that shocked me the most was when Rowdy Gaines told me I would trade any of my Olympic medals to a, to an NCAA title with Auburn because it's my alma mater. Mm. And I realized that at first I thought it was just words, you know, but then living the experience and 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 sharing the experiences with the boys and also uh, when one of your teammates, seeing one of your teammates perform extremely well, didn't perform extremely well, and knowing that um, you would feel like even worse than for yourself. That was really the, the experience of a, of a team meeting. Mm -hmm. And that really shocked me because I always thought that I was a team player and I love swimming in relays and I love being mm -hmm. a team member and I love the atmosphere. And I believe that 99% of the swimming world uh, continue to exist because of the, the fact that we, we train in teams and we live in pack. Mm. And, uh, and that, because the, the, the energy that shares from one teammate to another or from one staff member to another, it's one of the main reasons why swimming is so incredible to live from the inside. So, and, and when I got to Auburn, I, I really understood, although I didn't really grasp at the beginning, uh, you know, all the history and all what was behind because we, we kind of showed up and thinking we knew a few things, but we didn't know anything mm. um, beyond the Alabama accent and, and the Southern way of lifestyle. Mm -hmm. We didn't know much, but one thing we didn't know is how important it could be to, to the community, to some people. And when mm. you become part of something that it's much bigger than you, then you, mm. uh, you feel like you, it's just a different, it's just a different thing. And it, it just, it just changes you for the better. Yeah. You're, you're a very smart man. You always, always were like really intelligent. And one of the things I was telling Sergio again today, you know, we're just reminiscing on stories, but I just remember, you know, you and I, um, we didn't attend every class that we should have attended uh, early on in our college life. Um, there were times we were pretty focused on swimming and, and especially me, but you didn't seem to need to attend every class. Like I probably should have be going to a lot of classes you had this ability to kind of lock your door two or three days out from an exam and then appear three days later and just have memorized all the material and get, and get straight A's. You were, you were just really smart like that. I can always remember just the way that you downloaded information. And it seems like that, that has kind of carried you throughout your career in terms of the way you've been able to process information and, and memory and things like that. You, you've always been really good at that. Do you recognize that in yourself? I, I know that I always start too late, that's for sure, uh, that I'm always in a rush at the end, close to, to, close to the date, uh, I procrastinate, but, uh, but when, I, when, I, when the matter comes really closed and I really get involved and I, and I shift concentration, I know that, but uh, with swimming, I would say that it's it always been a little bit different, as in, like, I believe that what I learned in Auburn was a, a true treasure for my following coaching career, that every day, pretty much, I learned something, whether it be from my teammates, from the amazing, amazing teammates, and also the amazing coaches that we have had uh, over the years, and that there was so much uh, unbelievable material that was displayed every day in training and everything that when I started coaching, I didn't realize that I learned so much every day because my process, my brain didn't process like that. My brain was too... Um, working like I'm listening to something and I, I was always um, finding out, can I learn it really quickly, even on my own? Is it something that I can do when I prefer to do it on my own time or do I need to listen to understand? But with swimming, because I've always been passionate with swimming, it was just like learning lesson all day long, you know, coming mm -hmm. to the pool in the morning. And I, I, one of the things that shocked me is there's so many good swimmers that people don't know about because they only compete in yards and they were mm. so amazing and the words that they could express how, how to improve and everything. And the, uh, beyond the energy was also like the, the fact that there was many, many smart people around uh, there in, the, in the NCAA system. You, you, you surround yourself with a lot of smart people. They're not only mm. swimmers, but they were also excellent students. Uh, obviously the coaching staff is uh, second to none. Like a, and there's so many good coaches in the U.S. There's so many people. And their experiences is so rich because they mm -hmm. have had the chance to be a swimmer before and to be surrounded by great coaches, to be surrounded by great athletes and all that. So I realized that I learned way more than I knew 
I had in me when I started coaching. And I think I, I, I believe it's pretty much the same as you. We started great athletes right, right from the get-go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which could be an uncomfortable situation. It's a privilege, of course, because it's always easier to work with high material, high talent. But it's also like, you know, the athletes can be cruel sometimes and they expect so much mm. from the coach. Mm. They expect you to leave them alone when they feel good and they, help, they expect you to find all the answers, even at the highest level, yeah. like this in one second. And, and the fact that we had so much material in the bank that uh, was really useful. Yeah. And I, I, I think that, you know, and the numbers and the, and the sets and the workouts, workouts that David Marsh will pull out uh, just like that in one instant will be really good workouts and everything. And I really try to, you know, memorize and play this game of, you know, understanding and then stuck in it in my uh, hard disk as much as I could because just I yeah. like doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you replicated a lot of stuff from, from what you learned in college. I mean, we always called you Coach Romy. That was kind of your nickname, Coach Romy. You, you're always kind of almost destined to be a coach and, and a successful one because of your intelligence. And you, you replicated a lot of what you learned at Auburn and then you took it in, into French swimming and, and changed the, the culture in French swimming as well and the mindset. And, and I certainly want to go into that. But just in terms of your learnings from – the first, the first season. Why, why did we win? Like, why, what separated that team? Why were we national champions for the first time in in the school's history on that year, particularly? One of the thing was, I, I truly believe there was like a, a care for one another that was beyond probably any other team. Like one of the memory that I cherish and I liked is we were doing a set for Christmas training at this particular time of the year where you do crazy stuff and. I remember just uh, going in the first lane with the backstrokers and doing a set. And I was beating one of the guys from the team. And he, he heard that I was here and he found out that, hey, this, guy, this French guy is not that bad. He can be helpful. And he, after every repetition, he would come out and scream at me to encourage me to do better even on the next set. Mm. And he was forgetting about himself to promote my, my own performance. Mm. This, was, this was something special. I think the link was there. Uh, I would say also that the belief was there that there was something that was just uh, people were convinced that it could happen. Mm. That not, not on the, the arrogant side of things, but like for once we, we have all this puzzle and we are every single piece of the puzzle. We can make mm. it possible. I, I truly believe that anytime it happens, it's because, pe because athletes or coaches are convinced that it can happen. It is like a mm. superior power mm -hmm. that guides you every day. You do not want to waste one workout. You do not want to waste one communication, strong, intense communication between a coach and an athlete or between two athletes. And, and you have your antennas out and, and trying to, to hear everything, listen to everything, challenge everything, try everything. And it, the atmosphere, I would say, was just uh, one that's uh, – help us make the right decision. Uh, there was rules, and you know that young people usually don't like to, li to listen to the rules um, to explain to the people that listen to us. Uh, mm. there was a, they, they established at Auburn at the time the dry season, which means you can party a little bit from September until December, and December 1st, start, uh, January 1st start. And there's no, you're not allowed to drink one glass of alcohol, you're not allowed to party, you're not allowed to do anything. It lasts mm. for three and a half months, which could be a big sacrifice for young guys especially. In mm -hmm. the, campus and, and university system and I, I truly believe that you know for those three months everybody was playing by the rules not because they were enforced but because they were embraced yeah yeah I like that I, li I like that I like that belief you know that the unwavering und undoubtful you know this is like it's it's gonna happen you know we're gonna do this and but with that um, with that takes a commitment too right a yeah, commitment, and I would add also that luck is always plays a good part. The fact that you and us came yeah. brought, brought like that special energy uh, that that made it turn around. You you came as a yeah as a really fast swimmer, so people knew that uh, there was a new a new sprinter in town that could really bring energy to the relays. And the fact that nobody knew really who we were and, and Lionel was uh, Lionel Moreau that ended up mm -hmm. being national champion was an amazing pick for Auburn. He was an Auburn guy, stayed very long in the Auburn community. Uh, I was okay and Lionel was a no-now uh, swimmer. Yeah. And, and yeah. we ended up like adding these uh, special um, bonuses to the team. And even the best teams sometimes when they get close to the competition, when you add 
um, element of success inside the process while the yeah. process is already well advanced then it then it brings this special thing that you know it, it becomes more and more um possible yeah and it engages everybody for sure and uh and and i think also it brought that from what i i see it now but maybe i'm not being objective because it's us and because it's easy to write the story it's easier to write the story afterwards but um we we brought this special energy because we didn't know anything we didn't know yards uh yeah we didn't know nca we didn't know the level of competition we would face and we came in with that candid an absolutely enthusiastic approach every day to training, mm. which was probably fresh to the people that were on their senior year, you know, or their junior year and really hoping to get that result. We didn't know what it was. It was our first year. It was experimentation for us. It was just giving it a go with no uh, second thoughts. And I think you'll also perform really well when you're free in your head, when you, when you carry no bags or no nothing, you know, and you just express yourself. Yeah. And I think that that also... And luckily, I think Auburn was this special place that would uh, welcome us for being different. We were very, very different uh, from our, not, on, not only the language, because we weren't the only one facing problems with people understanding us. I remember you trying to rely on us to help you order some, some orange juice one day because no one <laughs> would understand you trying to order with your Australian accent. <laughs> so, I mean, and, you know, oh, the, 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 the small history, the small pieces of, you know, of the story, but it, it, it brings, I think it adds up. It, it's so complex to yeah. try to define why would a team succeed, succeed or not. But I think you're right. Like, I think you can choose to win. I think you can choose to lose by by actions that you take and, and um, you know, maybe maybe some um, decisions that you make, right? I, and when I look at our three years there or, or my three years there where I was there, 97, 98, 99, Stanford came in to Auburn. The NCAAs was at Auburn, was at our home. And, and we almost kind of took it for granted at that point. Not almost, we really did. And we were doing things that were outside the boundaries of what we allowed ourselves to do the previous year when we were winning, when we were winners. And we had this, this nobody knows us, you know, we're going to go prove it to the world type mentality. Next year, it was like we did the little things that enabled us to guarantee that we would not win. That's what I think. What do you think? I agree. I agree that um, they, they said it's harder to win again, you know, back to back. But uh, for sure, we didn't, uh, I'm looking for the word, we didn't uh, digest the first win fast enough to put mm -hmm. ourselves in a position to reset and mm -hmm. to uh, reinvent the next team to be back on the fundamentals, but different enough from the year before. I think we were too much right. the same, right. but not, not based on enough of the little things that makes you win. You know, it's so right. many little things. It's, it goes from, you know, what you say every day in training to, to, one, to the attitude that you have when you, when you have a great set and, mm. and, and uh, carrying your, your, your teammate that's not doing something perfect and everything. Mm. And the year after was more of a year that uh, we didn't think right, we didn't act right. Uh, we didn't mm -hmm. perform all those little things. Yeah. We got smashed. Yeah. One of the great things David Marsh do, uh, among the many great things that he did, one, one was uh, he made us stay and watch uh, Stanford celebrate into our own pool. Mm. You know, kind of create a scar. And he used that material right after that, a week after. We had a meeting and he said, like, uh, do you want to live this again next year or no? And we made that decision and we, um, we swallow our pride for a couple of weeks and then we went back to work and we went back to, to doing what we knew how to do and we did it in the right way and we won mm -hmm. again. And, and it was a great lesson because that happens to so many swimmers. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I believe that uh, a good coach, an experienced coach, um, can, can prevent a little bit of that. But for sure, I think David was also being an Auburn man, probably overwhelmed by the 97 win. Because yeah. it, 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 it gets big and, and it's a small community. And when, when you win something big at the small level, it creates so much excitement that you can get lost a little bit in that excitement. And, and you can lose just maybe one week or two weeks before realizing, but it's already too late for the next step. And, and then you learn and then you go back. But it, it happened to me so many other times after. And yeah. um, it's, it's very tough to prevent. 
You went on after Auburn, just like me, to, to swim internationally, have a good career as well. Um, you and I were never um, Olympic medalists, but we were always at the big meets competing. Um, but in, in terms of um, the difference between uh, being a college athlete and being a professional swim swimmer at, at the international level, what are the differences for people like what are the what are the differences between these these guys that are coming out of college now and the ones that are, are winning medals internationally and competing you know for years on end internationally i i saw a few interviews like i, I still follow very closely what's going on in the us and and i that would i would take two two examples i think that would, uh, so i think reagan smith was talking about the fact that she's lo loving the pro style Right. And we see Leon Marchand decided to stay one more year in the Arizona process. Mm. Uh, I, I would say that uh, it's not a fit for everybody because uh, you, kids must understand that um, when, you, when you come inside a team, it comes with a lot of perks and a lot of privileges and a lot of fun, mm. but also with counterparts that you, you have to um, set aside some part of yourself and give it to the team. Mm. And, and some people don't do so well with that, which is fine. You know, you just got to understand it. And some people cannot live without it. That's probably one of the reasons why so many uh, kids want to stop after the NCAA is not getting involved. Some, some might not be successful because they're so good in the water, but I, I guarantee there's so many talents that stops and that don't even get motivated for the mm -hmm. long season, for the long course season, because they just love the team process. Right. I think there's a, there's, there's a, if you find a guy that just needs the team and the team can just um, makes him better, I think it's it's fine. I, I I I was really 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 happy to see that Leon took that decision. There's there's a to me amateur sport is much better than professional uh, always because um, I see it from the coach's perspective. When you start coaching professional, it means they have also other endorsement, and when you start. Um, planning success for your athletes you start by putting dates where you don't have the availability of training mm. because they have to accept so you, you start by narrowing mm. uh your um, your spectrum of, of improvement and you, your chances of success mm. Although when when you actually say okay i'm yours uh, if i if i if i'm leon i say bob i'm yours next year make me the best swimmer you can make me yeah. you know and, uh, and use your brain to make me better. You don't start by saying, I'm turning pro, uh, talk to my agent. This is what yeah. we're going to do. This, yeah. You know, and, and, and mm -hmm. to me now, the more and more, I just, I just love the fact that uh, we judge performance none on the number of medals, but on the sense that the, the swimmer that you helped, was he really close to his full potential or not? Well, am I really proud? When the lights, when the cameras turn off, could have done better. Yeah. Could, have, could have helped him improve or should have said no to this endorsement. So that week he could have trained better. We could have prepared better for this competition. These kind of, these kind of questions that um, athletes should ask themselves. Yeah. Because when you enter the world of swimming, you don't do it. Uh, you're not a, a professional soccer player. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a very different kind of sport. And uh, I, I, my preference goes to um, to the athletes that can remain as long as possible the amateur of the sport. Mm. Because the minute they become a professional, usually it's the minute that they don't really improve anymore. They just, uh, they just um, rely on what they have accomplished in the past. Sometimes they get lucky, they, they perform pretty well. But it, this is not how I judge my performance as a coach. Uh, and that's something I've learned as a swimmer that I've let so many things I probably would have never stand a chance to earn an Olympic medal, but I know that I could have done better. And right, when, right. You, when you, when your career ends, um, uh, then you, you regret some of that stuff. So if I can send, if it's wisdom, I don't know, but if I can send a message every time you ask the question, try to picture yourself after your career and realize, was it the right choice? Was, was a few thousand dollars worse not mm. getting that sense of accomplishments that you feel like I've been, I've gone beyond what I ca could actually do. And I've surprised myself. Or did I just follow my career, follow my path and made some compromises along the way? Yeah. Yeah. Good, good point. I, I didn't think of it like that. It's true. Um, what got you into coaching? I fell into coaching. I had to come back and finish my degree. Uh, Ralph Crocker, one of the coaches at Auburn got sick and I, David asked me to fill in and, and that was kind of the end of it. Like I just started coaching a group and 
didn't even think about coaching, but th that was it. I had to do it. So what, what about you? What was your transition? Oh, I, I coached Auburn a little bit before I started coaching in France. And one of my first gig was to, as a, as a master's degree uh, coach, I was coaching uh, the team at the NCAA. I don't remember if it was, I think, 2002. And I was coaching one swimmer from Texas. Uh, Tex, his nickname was Tex. Oh, and, he, and, he, and he missed out. He didn't show up uh, for, that, for his event because he was putting on a suit. And he, I think he got confused with the time or a little bit scared or freaked out a little bit. I don't know what happened, but he never showed up behind the blocks. And we realized we lost like many, many points for him not showing up. We got a penalty. Mm -hmm. So my first gig was uh, having to face the rest of the coaching staff and the athletes because I was in charge at the end. Uh -huh. So, but it, it was great learning experience. Uh, being, being able to be on deck at the NCA, I realized that uh, uh, it was it was a very different sense of emotion that you would get as an athlete because you had your own responsibility. Mm -hmm. And even when you were on the relay, you could actually express yourself at the competition. But when you were a coach, it's actually much, much of the work was done until the, the race started. And then, then you, you carry all your fears and you just had to watch right. uh, all your emotion go into the pool with absolutely no control over it. And I right. realized that it was it was also a fun game. And I, it was actually the closest game to feel alive than I could feel when I was an athlete. And I also realized that maybe I could be a little bit better than I was an, as, a, as an athlete because I, I always liked sharing and doing it for others. And that could help me get that extra mile that I couldn't really do for myself. Mm. And then I came to France and I kind of fell into it also. Uh, to make the long story short, I started right away in Marseille, the same club team as I'm here now. And there was a, a, a young swimmer by the name of Alain Bernard that was there, ended up being Olympic champion, 100 freestyle. And he was a swimmer of the team and he had a coach, uh, Denis Auguin. And although I, I could not really see him becoming an Olympic champion, he was a great swimmer and I really wanted to help him become a, a better swimmer. But we disagree on the view that uh, I didn't want to build a program based on two, three swimmers. When I was coming mm. from Auburn, was, it was a program for 40. Right. Because it was a city, the city of Marseille is over 1 million people. And I realized that what I wanted to do was like the Auburn model or like the team unit model. And uh, we didn't get along that year. And uh, I told him that uh, I didn't agree. And, and the board of the club team decided to follow my vision. And they ended up going to Antibes and being very successful at the club of Antibes, uh, one and a half hour away. And I tried to hire Fred Venu um, because the, the idea was to have Denis Auguin, the coach of Alain Bernard, on the sprint side, Fred Venu, and really built a powerhouse of sprinting and mid distance in Marseille. But uh, Fred decided otherwise and stayed in Scotland, which. He was very successful also. And the president of the club team told me, now you've made a big mess. Let's fix it by coaching. And I said, I'm not a coach. He said, but you try it. You try it. And if you like it, you stay. And if you don't, you have time to find someone. But we need a coach. So I started coaching. And um, no, not really with an idea that I was a coach. And maybe two, three years later, I realized mm. that I've spent two or three years coaching and not looking for another coach. And that <laughs> lasted around 15 years. And I really fell in love with the job. I fell in love with a mission uh, mm. because I felt so confident in what, all of that I've learned, you know, especially at Auburn, that I could, I didn't want to copy exactly, but I knew I could use. It was a blueprint at least. Yeah. It was, it was a blueprint. And then I realized that French people are not Americans. Uh, you, you have to tweak it a little bit because it doesn't work. We, we made a different way of thinking. Yeah, our history is so different that, you know, you cannot apply everything, but, but the recipe for success was in the blueprint and and I felt it right away and I felt like the better the swimmer was the easier it was because I was prepared for that and I had I had many of the first answers at some point they asked me a few questions that I couldn't answer and that kept me awake at night but at the beginning I could feel the energy from the program we were mm. offering from the energy and and the improvement it was really really quick and what happens in in a small country like France is when you have a, a program that improves it really attracts all the other best swimmers in France because they see something is being done differently. Your swimmers become your best ambassadors and, and they actually recruit for you. And then all of a sudden you build a team without really understanding how it happened so quickly. Mm. Problems come came a little bit after when you have to stabilize and when you have right, to continue right. improving on a higher level and everything. But at the beginning, it was it was not really anticipated, but it was really just just uh, full of energy and just so exciting and, and the first swimmers fred bousquet came uh, and we we came back to you we did, did some back and forth you and me for a while 
but he really helped the program the first year. And, and Fabien Gillot, who ended up being the captain of the French team and Olympic champion in the four by one, came right away. And I could realize that they, they, they shook off all my doubt because they liked what we were doing and I knew they would improve on it. And we really moved really quickly on that. When did, when did it really start to click? When, when were things like really clicking for you? What year was that? Because I, I remember the time frame. I just don't know um, exactly when it was just like at its, at its peak of just like everything was working. After we made many big mistakes, First, it was kind of easy because there was a lot of room for improvement. Then you become a little bit arrogant thinking, this job's easy. I don't understand why coaches say it's one of the hardest jobs yeah, in the I world. That. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and all of a sudden, you're starting to get closer to the, to the potential of your athletes and, and you, yeah. you, you, you make a few mistakes. And, and swimmers don't perform at the right moment when it's Olympic trials, for example, and you spend one week at Olympic trials while trying to hide any way you can in the pool because it's horrible one race after another and you realize that it's actually a tough job and you actually have to have a lot of humility when you do it and a lot of a, a lot of like put yourself back, back you know, in, a, in question every time to make sure that what, you, what you're offering is still right and, and you have to question what you're doing all the time and trying to improve. And um, it started in 2005. We, we picked a few medals on the way, but we were not really on the scene. Like we, it was good because to our level, it was massive improvement. Picked up a few medal world championship in 2007. It was good. And then came 2008, which we thought would be the great year. It wasn't what we thought. We ended up with three medals for the guys from Marseille on the, on the relay. Uh, it was good. But then 2009 came the suits. Like everyone else, we kind of tried to understand what was going on and how to adapt and everything. And uh, we, I don't think we really followed the path, which was a, a blessing in disguise. Like a lot of people were using the suits to really swim fast in that moment. I didn't really uh, do that. And I was so also uh, back onto what I missed in 2008 and all the mistakes and I was trying to fix it that really I didn't really pay attention to the 2009 evolution. And uh, we ended up, I think, doing a lot more than a lot of the competition because you could swim fast with less training. And also because I believe that in swimming, especially in Europe, we do a lot of yardage and we do a lot of training. And when you, when you do a lot, sometimes you realize, and I realized it first when I came to the U.S., that you can do less to do better, to train better, to train a race pace, to train faster, to actually mm -hmm. repeat so many quality, quality things. Uh, and a lot of people went back to that model in 2009. They experimented with a race-based model a lot more. It wasn't USRPT, but it was a lot of faster swimming, putting the suit in training and everything. Yeah. And we didn't, we didn't go really good at that. I remember that we did a lot of World Cups in a in brief, and they were getting smashed uh, mm -hmm. and getting yelled at by the direction of the French Federation, the head coaches of France, because I, I entered people that were supposed to be in the top five and ended up being 45th. Or they're swimming only in the morning. I would send them to the weight room. And then an idea that it was improvement time and we could always rest at the end. We did okay at World Championship in, in 2009, but actually I think the taper of World Championship was just like a recovery of the whole year of training. Mm. And then we started 2010 and, and had a different set of athletes that were that improved for a year, a year and a half. Mm. And then we went back to the, to the, to the jammers and they started becoming good and they have never experienced what it is like to win. Uh, really, and they started becoming some 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 guys were becoming the best swimmers in the world, and and it just kind of grew confidence, and and also it was just just like it happened in Auburn, there was like a sense that uh, we were we were gonna be good, and Camille Lacour popped up, and and Fabian started swimming fast, and uh, we had also some foreign swimmers training with us, and and all of a sudden we came to European Championship in 2010, we had some really good performances that placed us in the top three in the world rankings. And all of a sudden, that something started. It ignited, ignited. Sorry, mm -hmm. and and uh, and the staff started becoming better. Uh, I always had an amazing staff surrounding me. I was uh, had a guy named James Gibson <laughs> uh, that that used to be a swimmer. That because mm -hmm. of injury started coaching. Uh, we all know now that he's one of the great coaches in sprinting, and he mm -hmm. was there writing some great workouts, um, giving some good advices to the kids, and and he was challenging me, and I was trying to challenge him. And I've learned well from David that when you're surrounded by really good coaches, it, at the end, it's going to make a better team. And I was right. embracing that, you know, this mentality that, I, you know, I, when Dave Durden was at Auburn and he was coaching with David Marsh, I could see what talent with talent can do. You know, it's not, it's not just two people. It becomes something special. 
I think they understand it so well that they want to reunite 20, 30 years later. They can't get away from each other. <laughs> but uh, but I, I, I wasn't afraid of having a coach that's probably in many different aspects was better than me. Uh, and he is better than me in many different aspects. And I was confident in what I could bring. You know, I can, I, I, I can, I can do my part. I can, I cannot do all the parts, but I can do my part. And I know that the parts that I love, I can, I can train and improve to a level that you can, you know, I, I don't have to fight against you to prove that I'm a better coach than you, but I can become really, really good at some things. And if you become really, really good at some things, then the athletes will perform really well. And so 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014 and 15, we were able to win a lot of races and, and, uh, Best accomplishment for sure would be um, a world champion with four guys from Marseille. So French team was world champion. But the wow. four guys were training in Marseille, and this was in 2014 in Doha, short course. Wow. We, won the, we won the short course world with four guys from the same club team. This was something mm. special. Wow. Uh, and Kazan, Kazan in 2015, we got bronze medal in the 4 by one medley with four guys from the same club team, four French guys. Wow. So th this was, uh, you know, like that kind of – puts the whole story together and, and you know, you have like, you're of course facing an amazing generation and there was this chemistry around the staff going that was really around like the high, high level and the trying to achieve the highest uh, level. And um, I had guys not being satisfied when they didn't medal at Worlds or didn't make a final, you know, mm. like the standard just went really, really high. Yeah. And uh, that, that really clicked for six, seven years on that generation. And it was, it was just really good also, and the, the, the strength coach was really good. The, the, the mental preparation guy, the sports psychologist, now is, is still uh, still in the in the game. He's following Lyon. He's been working with Lyon for three, four years. Was with us for twelve years. Oh, oh wow! He was really was really pushing us. And James was really pushing. And I have two French guys with me, two amazing coaches. One of them by the name of Julien Jacquier, and the other one Mathieu Burban. They're just amazing. They just like as good as any coaches in the U.S. or in Australia, you know. We don't have 40 or 50 or 100 like they have in the U.S., but we have seven or eight or 10 really good coaches in France. And mm. I was fortunate enough to work with two or three of them at the same time. Mm. So uh, when you say blueprint and replicating, for sure, at some point, I had a, a coaching staff worse, worse the, the level of what I could find, what, what I had found in Auburn at some part, you know, it was, yeah. it was amazing discussion over coffee, over watching the Mediterranean Sea after training, some really good stories when, uh, when the guys would, would you know, uh, give me something that's just like, you know, it's amazing. Like, um, one day Fabian was getting ready for world championships and he was really in a bad, bad, bad time of his preparation. And uh, he could not really make the times that I was asking. And one of my assistant coach looked at me and say, just, just re um, rest him seven, eight weeks. Yeah. This guy doesn't work like anybody else. He will yeah. work differently. Rest him. And he gave me the courage to try something that I've never tried before. It's right. an extended taper. And he was really bad for three weeks. He was okay for, after four weeks. And I felt mm -hmm. like I hit the peak and he was coming down. He came down a little bit and he came after seven or eight weeks. And I had amazing world championship after eight mm -hmm. weeks. And it shook my, all my beliefs that, you know, there's mm -hmm. not one way to do things. And people right. are unique. And, they, and, uh, and the guy was uh, just an assistant coach. But he, he could feel, he could sense the things that a head coach can feel. And he was... He felt the freedom to express it and to take yeah. the risk because uh, because uh, he understood the full responsibility of me following his advice and Fabien doing something well, not doing something well. The best of the story was he never mentioned after. He never said, hey, I saved your ass that day. He never <laughs> said that. Uh, he was just, I think, happy to see Fabien perform and knowing yeah. that he had a part in it. That's the freedom I lost at some point as the head coach at Auburn, you know, as, a, as an assistant Richard Quick, David Marsh gave me gave me freedoms to just just go, just create, just throw caution to the wind. I, I noticed a huge shift once I became a head coach in terms of my my ability just to 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 throw caution to the wind and to trust myself or just take a chance. I was much more cautious and probably to the point of where I didn't I didn't even take those chances anymore. You know, so I was afraid. I was I was I was working in fear, whereas before you're you you're just surrounded by fear. You let the fear out, and it just it, you just you're celebrating the fear. But the the fear on on the head coaching side was 
I can't get these results because this will happen and that'll happen and this will, you know, so you, you start to really constrict yourself in, in times of um, a lot of pressure, don't you? I wasn't fortunate enough to, uh, to get to know Richard Quick the way you did because I truly believe that he probably was amazing also. Yeah. But, uh, but I know that one of the greatest strengths of David was yeah. uh, his way of, of seeing before anyone else when someone understood high-level swimming or not. Yeah. And it didn't matter after that, that he, when he knew that you understood it in your own world, because David has his own world, his own way of thinking. Right. And when he understood that you understood it, then he let go and he let you do it. And I think it was also, it was his great, one of his great strengths was to, to be able to let go to, to the edge, sometimes man, over the edge. But if you do it with the right person or in the right, with the right staff, it actually does things that are amazing. Yeah. When you give dirt, when you gave yeah. dirt and that, that, that power with dirt, it's not risky with someone else. Maybe it would have been. And then, and, and, and well, he did and that with me. He gave me, he, he basically, he basically gave Caesar's yellow to me. He, he said, here's a future Olympic champion. Go and go and take him. But he, one, I believe, but maybe if he watches us or maybe he will disagree, but he only did it because he believed you could do better than him with that special guy because your desire to make him better was stronger than, than everything that he had to do. So he could feel that. And also sure. he's a smart coach and understands that um, the communication between a swimmer and an athlete is something special. And it's not, it's not something you work on, you know, it's just like between a man and a woman, right. you know, and it, it's called, I mean, it's harmony mm -hmm. to some, to some extent it's love, it's care. And it, it's, 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 um, it's goodwill. I mean, and, and when you met Caesar, you had this special bond. You right. guys couldn't understand each other without talking. When I met Florent, it was pretty much the same. Well, that's what I was going to say. You you did the same thing with James Gibson and, and Flo. At some point, you you let those two go and have a relationship that took them beyond as well, right? Like it made James the coach he is today. It made Flo the swimmer he is today. You allowed you allowed that to happen too. Because I believe that in the end, uh, the great swimmers performed when they are when it's their own performance. And I also know that uh, athletes, especially the good ones, uh, they when they don't want something, they'll they'll let it know, and they'll. Uh, so you cannot fake it. You cannot fake the relationship when the the the, the medals is at stake. So I knew that when I put uh, James and Florent together into a workout, I could feel that the energy was so positive hmm. that it was something good. Why get on? Why get in the way? Because when, when an athlete doesn't want to work with the coach, he'll let you know. If a Brett had said to Caesar, um, David had said to Caesar, go work with Brett, Caesar works for one week and comes back to David and said, you know, I'm not sure with Brett. He, he's too intense or he's too this or he's, he's crazy because he's so young or he's too young. You know, he would have said it. And mm -hmm. David would have said, we made this experience. Let's try this. He would have found a way for you to get involved in some other mission without you right. knowing it's a different, it's a different path. Right. But, but when, he, when he said it, there was one workout and it was evidence you know, and all of a sudden, you know, you, you, you were able in, into your program to set up like roots for success at some point. And if you, David was really good at, at planting seeds of success everywhere around the program and with water, because it's our element, then it grows really fast. And then at the end of the year, you see some crazy stuff. And I'm sure now that uh, when, he, when he saw Dave Durden evolved, although at the beginning, Dave was worried that he was so enthusiastic, wanted us to swim, make us swim so fast. At the, at the beginning, I could say like he could he could believe that I have to be careful because he's good, but he, he's will. The minute he understood that he was actually the amazing coach that we all know now, then he let go and he knew that he would be successful without having to do very much. And uh, and mm. and also, I believe that he was interested in the fact that he would learn in the process, because uh, one of the things David is good at and. You know, a lot of coaches is that they love learning, just like athletes. They like learning new skills. You know, this is almost the same feeling as winning a medal because we all know that winning a medal happens too, not, not often enough, you know, to carry your uh, motivation. Whereas winning in practice is winning in practice against someone that's better than you, learning a new skills, getting a feel for the water, the, the water that you never had, beating you, your best time in training, all those little small wins every day adds up to uh, making you want to come back to the next session. And, yeah. and I think David, David loved watching uh, uh, 
teams of success, small teams of success right. inside a big team. Right. Yeah. D David's always been really good at that and had a lot of success with it. I've had instances where it's absolutely worked and it's been glorious. And then I've had instances where it, where it hasn't. And I don't know if you've, you've had these instances, but basically it becomes this, um, you know, game of Thrones, uh, it, it, we could say where, this is my athlete. I did this. I Even though you're part of the same team, you're fighting for the same thing, it becomes my athlete, my result. You're there. I'm here. And you're split. There's a division. I, I've certainly had that in my career. Uh, I didn't have that with Sergio Lopez. Sergio comes in. And from the moment we united, it, it was, and I only had Sergio for a year, but it was like the one of the greatest years of coaching in my life. It was the last year that I actually coached. But it, when, when it's... When when it's a team like that, when there's an agreement, it's different, isn't it? And then and when it when there's not, it can rip a team apart. For sure. And and the the people that you give freedom to, or like you, you give them a part of something that's part of like very important part of the team is it is key. And I I love Sergio. I don't know him very well, but I know we have a lot of appreciation for one another. And I and I love his brain. In swimming, you know. uh, and that's why I, I specifically mentioned when David gave it to Dave Durden because it was this specific situation of of two super talented coach right. that do, don't care about boundaries. They care about they love the, the the element, they love the team aspect, they love the part of being part of something that's that 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 just that just exciting, and they're. And it's really tough. And uh, that's why I said a little earlier in our discussion, it's also luck. You know, you, uh, Michael Phelps, Bob Bowman, it's it's a lot of luck. Leon Marchand, Bob Bowman, it's, it's winning the, the lottery twice in your life as a coach, you know, mm -hmm. to have these yeah. two special guys. Yeah. Uh, for sure. I mean, it, it's not only luck because they, there's so much uh, abilities and talents as, in the coach and as well as in, in the athletes that it doesn't happen twice by accident i don't believe it doesn't happen once 23 gold medals but it cannot happen twice in the lifestyle mm -hmm. but but truly also i i believe that uh and i want david to hear that he was really lucky to have some of his uh, member mm -hmm. thinking about kim bracken that uh, uh was a perfect fit at some point to the mm -hmm. personality of david and to make the team better and this is exactly what we needed at some mm -hmm. point not only enthusiasm, but also a woman touch with a little toughness, but the right kind of toughness, mm -hmm. tough but kind at the same time, and everything. Is it? But is it genius? Probably a little bit of it. Is it luck? Is it a mix of the two? And and I think that that's um, that's that 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 was really the key. And also, uh, David has one one thing that's really good. His brain just doesn't work normally. So sometimes, you know, that actually really helped him in many different ways. But then when there was danger, he wasn't rational about it. Where maybe you were rational at some point, or maybe I was rational at some point. And we killed some of those uh, great, exciting moments because we think rational and because we right. want, you know, performance and everything. And he was probably detached enough and also confident enough because uh, one thing that, that always that I always find amazing is sometimes like he was busy with many different things. He would show up and we, and he took over took control over the, the, the session and he was able to take control, not, a, not being here the whole day, take control the last half hour and do it with um, uh, ability that it was just amazing. And he, he yeah. could take away with some situation because probably of his abilities or of his own way of thinking that was very different, like close to autism, you know, just a, <laughs> uh, ADD, yeah, autistic and ADD, ADD and everything. But it, it, it really yeah. saved him because he didn't ask the wrong question. He just acted many times in a way that wasn't expected. And it actually helped him, you know, not disrupt, actually add. We hated when he was coming at the end of training, but we actually accepted it because it was David and because of all, all the other qualities and everything that he was doing for us. I, I think I don't know if I've told you this, but I, I think sometimes isn't it freaky that you and I were roommates together? We turn up to America on the same day, you know, like we live together, we have these experiences together, and then 2008, I have a hand in coaching the Olympic champion in the 50 free, and then four years later, you have a hand in coaching the Olympic champion in the 50 free. How crazy is that? You know, crazy, crazy because like. Uh... 
we don't know each other and the next day people say this is your friend and uh, and maybe one week later we're living together and uh, at the end of the day you know and swimming is magical for this swimming in the u.s especially um you know they just a and inspiration was there uh there was never competition between us uh first because i didn't understand the 50 meter very well at least <laughs> as an athlete um and 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 because also there was that this urban link that was uh, that was still there years after yeah, yeah, yeah. like when you when you won it was brett from auburn and Caesar yellow from auburn yeah. And in 2012, when we were battling against each other, it was Florent Manadou on the urban way of training for me. And it was you with uh, Cesar Cielo. And he was Colin Jones with David Marsh. So, so it, for me, it wasn't even like France versus Australia versus the US and everything. It was just like where I'm from, because that's what I felt like. Yeah. Uh, the essence of sprinting and, and the understanding was there. And it, it just goes beyond. And so many of the, s- the stories that happen in swimming Thanks to um, thanks to the U.S., thanks to the university university systems that brings a lot of the best in the world and everything. Now swimming has become more worldwide. Swimmers get used to going and training with each other and everything. But back then, you know, it was like it was weird to to, to know that uh, in the final of the Olympics, the competition that you face, you know the athletes very well and you know the coaches even better than the athletes. Yeah. You know, and, and and it's weird because it's supposed to be a place where you face competition that you don't know, and it wasn't like that then. And uh, it's 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 uh, something with the years passing that you cherish even more. You know, we don't talk very often, although uh, when you send me that 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 message saying, "Do you want to chat?" I was I was as excited to talk to you as I was to talk on the on the podcast. Yeah. It was a great opportunity. Yeah, man, I've missed you for sure. We don't we don't do it enough, and uh, you know you're. You, your family to me, no matter what, no, no matter how, how many years pass, it's it's like you and I, even just to see you on the screen right now, I haven't seen your face like this in a number of years. And it's and it feels like we're still, you know, hanging out together in the apartment. You know, it feels it like makes, yesterday. Uh, makes me uh, miss those good days. Ozzy Quevedo, Aaron Charla, yeah. Lionel yeah. Moreau, you know, the, the boys, you know, I mean, yeah. that's what, that, that's what, you know, I really want to, uh, swimming does that, you know. Well, and think of, we think of all the people that we've just mentioned, right? Like, you know, you, you've just mentioned those guys, but then you mentioned all those coaches earlier. Like the day that I turned up to America, I was nobody. I was not, I was not anybody in the swimming world. I was not a great swimmer. I was, I was nothing really. The only good thing I had done up to that point was make the decision to go to America. So like you probably, and you're the same, like no one knew who you were. You were nobody and you turn up and look at the career you've had now and, and look at the influences you've had. Changed my life for sure. Yeah. But but like, but you're one of the world's best as well. It's not like you just had a swimming experience. You had this experience where you go on to coach Olympic champions, world champions. Like you just said, four guys from the same team. Like nobody's done that. Like you, you did things that were just ridiculous off the map. But I always think back to that day when we turned up together, when we were nobodies and look at the careers we've had now that we could write a book on the careers that we've had. So like how much of that was, again, you talk about luck, how much of that was luck? And then how much of that is destiny for you and I? For sure, destiny and luck, but uh, a lot. You know, like I'll, I'll tell you quickly the story how I get to Auburn. It was Ms. Lionel and I, we had a friend from Finland and we missed qualifying for the Olympics in 96. And we ended up going on that during the Olympic Games. We went um, to visit our friends in Finland. And as we were walking around, uh, we had a plan to go to Auburn. And uh, we met a guy at a cafe uh, that had an Auburn shirt. And we told him, hey, you come from Auburn. This, this is the place where we want to go to school. We'd love to go to school with swimmers. And the guy was uh, the president of the University of Auburn. Wow. And he said, what are, what are your names? And so he wrote down the names. And then we got a call from David Marsh saying, apparently, you two boys, I need to uh, recruit you and, uh, and give wow. you a scholarship. He gave us books. For those that understand, we just got books. <laughs> but uh, we, got, we were accepted at Auburn. And, 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 and this definitely turned, turned, turned our lives around and made yeah. it for the better. But uh, w- one thing I want to say about this that's the most important is the opportunity to go to a different country and to go somewhere when you're 20 and get rid of all the things that maybe you don't like about yourself because we all have good sides and mm-hmm. bad sides. Mm-hmm. And one thing is you, you get to this place. No one knows you mm-hmm. and no one has 
judges you. You, you. The label that you have in your own club team, that mm -hmm. you're this guy, you're the best in sprinting and endurance. Sometimes you're not happy. You say, you say, you come to, our, to a new place and, and no one is judging you. All and right. you, create, you can create a new self. And right. that's what you did even better than Lionel and I. Yeah. You came in and you realized that you could be this energy boost for the team. You could be this special person. You actually, all the good things about you, you expressed them probably even louder than in Australia. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, that an impact that it was even more profound at Auburn because of your accent, because of your muscles, because of your speed, because of things that, and and also your personality was different. So, and you became a new, a, a, a new and better version of yourself. Right. So yeah. that's for sure. And and, yeah. and when you're 20 and you get this special chance in life to become the special athletes that you've always dreamed to be, but so many things are holding you back in your own mm. club team, in your own, because people are saying, okay, this is bread. Okay. He's happy. Okay. He's good. Okay. He's talented, but he's bread. People yeah. don't say the buddy's bread at the end or buddy's mm. Romeo, but he's Lionel. No mm. one say that they came in and they say, you sleep on the couch or during Christmas training and the, the two of you will be there. And, and, and because you're a freshman, but other than that, they trust you for trying as best as you can and being the best swimmers you can be. And they yeah. actually need you to become mm. really good. And, and to no surprises, it happens a lot of times that uh, you, you see a guy go into a university and becoming a great swimmer when he has talent or even becoming an amazing yeah. swimmer. Like uh, for Leon Marchand, for sure, it was like that exact same case that happened to his level of talent. The kid is amazing material beyond anything we have seen in France with the versatility and everything. But I, I'm, I'm for sure he understood the same thing I understood 23 years ago was, you know, I can, I can just let go of a few things that I don't like about myself. I will be this new Leon that, 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 that's the better version of myself. Let me ask you this, because you have a crazy, freaky elephant memory. His dad, his dad came to swim at Auburn for a period of time, you know, as a, as a professional athlete, French swimmer. Did Leon, was he ever on the pool deck at Auburn as a baby? Sure. Did, I, did I ever hold this kid as a baby? For sure. He lived at Auburn for one year, Leon. So Leon I lived with I us. I definitely held him then. Yeah, for sure. It was when you when you say destiny, you know, the kid was destined to. Uh, he, his parents really, his dad uh, Xavier was uh, came to Auburn for one reason, tried to qualify for the Olympics, but also I think because like he re regretted not trying the adv the U.S. adventure. Mm. And I don't know if he planted that uh, seed in the brain of his son or if it was Leon, Leon's own idea, but I knew he really wanted to do it. And he came to Auburn with his wife. That's a former 400 IM. French uh, representative at the Olympic Games in 1992, uh, Céline Bonnet, uh, originally from the club of Marseille. And, uh, and Céline, the mom, and, and Xavier, the dad, came to Auburn and they, 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 care, they took with them uh, Lyon, that was uh, our little mascot for one year, living in Harvard Place for one year. Oh, man. Uh, so, 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 we had, so we had Lyon for one year, this little guy, this little kid, and then he started swimming back in Toulouse. And he went on to uh, to improve quite quickly. Amazing to follow now. So I definitely fed this little kid. I did something with it, you know, like I I, I wiped his butt or something, you know. And it was Rome, there. Romy, he won't come on my podcast, man. Why? I will ask him, but I'm not sure that's going to help. You know, he's he's this special kid. You know, he does whatever he wants. Why won't he says no to professional? It does he say yes to a lot of things? He said yes to other podcasts. What does he have something against I fed you? this kid? I fed this kid as a little baby. You just told me that he won't come on my podcast. I'm sure you can try to convince him now. What you know does that. he have against me? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying, but um, I'm having fun. He'll come on one day. He he will. He has to. Um, Hopefully, when he's Olympic champion after 2024. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, you go on to be the head of French swimming at some point. What happened there? How, how did that happen? I don't really know. Uh, I think they thought it was a smart choice, but it was a tough. It was a tough moment in my career because uh, I was at the same time head coach of France and head coach of Marseille. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, some collusion in there. We it was a time where France was a was a was a good, really good team, and there was a lot of coaches there. And to pick one of the head coach as being one of his coaching staff was something that that wasn't always easy. Uh, it was for sure a great learning experience, something that I can, you know, um, look 
onto a node that I improved in that time. And, you know, difficulties really help you to get better. But from 2013 until 2016, I was head coach. And uh, the last two years, I co-shared the head coaching position. I was the men's coach, head, co head coach position. And Fabrice Pellerin from Nice was the women's coach. And, and it, was, it was tough time for, I think, the both of us. But uh, it was also great times for sure, you know. Um, just that uh, now they, um, they have Jacko in France. Yeah, uh, yeah, how's I, that? For sure, it's good. I mean, Jacko is one of those. You know, in, in life, mm. you have those coaches that I, we mentioned it a little earlier in the podcast. People that understand high level, that they, yeah, they live twenty four seven for high level. Jacko is one of those smart mind that uh, you mm -hmm. can always talk to any level of swimmer, highest level possible. Swimmers will be happy to talk to him. They will learn yeah. a thing or two, and the coaching staff, you know, will, will always happy and. And he's, he's done it in Australia. No one, no one will satisfy 100% of the coaches. You know, they're, right, they're tough right. people too. They're tough people, but you, there's no way you can say that he did a bad job in Australia. And it's a tough place to, to because it's, it's really high culture and high, uh, high level. Yeah. And um, he was really good in Netherlands before. He was really good in Australia. And, uh, and again, you can say it's luck, but he's showing up to France and all of a sudden we have this guy that can be the next Michael Phelps. And is it uh, is it luck or is it just like when you start bringing good good energy and good people, then good things happen? You know, uh, I believe that he's one of those people that can help you uh, help France guide guide it to his best possible results according to, to the level of uh, swimmers. You know, this kind of guy that will take a, a team and that will make the first day good, create a dynamic, and at the end, you look at the medal medal tables and instead of having four or five medals, you have seven or eight. He does that little differences. Kids that could have finished fifth on a different atmosphere will create that special atmosphere that will transform it fifth place into bronze, fourth place into silver, uh, silver by one, 100 into gold. You know, just because the swimmer don't swim just for that gold medal, but it swimmed in reaction to the dynamic that's going on within the team for that week of competition. So he can be, he's one of those. And I think uh, France is fortunate to have this kind of expertise alongside uh, getting ready for 2024. Well, I will say this, man. Uh, I regarded you as one of the world's best coaches, best best minds, but you know, people that could communicate really well with athletes and get them to to perform and also create team atmosphere. I mean, you you just had it going on, but then there was some point where you backed away from all that and stepped away from that. For the past couple of years, you've kind of just disappeared from French swimming a little bit and, and taking on a kind of a back, a backseat role before you were at the forefront of it. Now you're kind of at the back of it. What, why the shift in the past three or four years? Uh, because swimming kind of destroyed my personal life several times because I'm too passionate. Uh, so it was also like, um, um, trying to, to build a family, which I did, uh, met a wonderful woman. And I have now two kids, one and two years old, so it's it's not easy. So four years ago, you know, I was still coaching and it was a time of change. So you turn 40 for those who already turned 40. It's not the end of the world, but sometimes uh, it changes you on the meaning of life. And yeah. um, and uh, I, I give a lot to the swimmers and sometimes I forget myself in the process. Right. And on some days you realize, is it all worth it? I love swimming to most important thing in my life you know i still spend one hour on the swimming uh websites and everything to follow i still know what's going on exactly to the details i travel with the team I, i'm not coaching every day now I'm, I'm coach of a water polo team high very high level so mm -hmm. i do pretty much the same thing every day which is planning uh trying to get athletes ready many many times it's, it's a different exercise but i have exactly the same uh tools that i've used as a coach i coach every morning for one 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 and a half hours uh, I travel a lot with the water polo team and I also go to all the training camps with the swimming team. I go to a lot of the competitions and I do some meetings with the, with the staff to help them out with performance. It's actually nice to be part of the performance, even though it could be at a different level. I still, I still enjoy some really good conversation and I'm in the, in the, in the outside uh, crew of uh, the preparation of Florent to help him out. Like, you know, I get access to all his videos. If I see something, I can send him a text saying, well, I think you should improve on that and things like that. I could still give him a, a few tips if I believe that they can be helpful. Mm. Uh, so I, I, I have many different missions now uh, that are really nice. I, I, have, I don't know if I go back uh, very soon to swimming. 
for sure I will go back at some point. I don't know if it will be to the highest level or if it's to learn how to swim to kids. Uh, and your transmission will be key. Uh, for sure to be involved in the process is very exciting. Uh, I, I need to be around high performance because they are the same questions, whether it's a water polo team that's trying to win the European title, European club mm. title, we're playing at the Champions League level, whether it's uh, it's being talking to the coaches to make sure that they, they with the team can perform at the very high level. It's not every day, but it's every other day. But at least it's that involvement with performance. It's right. the standing in the stands and, and feeling that or creating that artificial feeling that you're part of that performance and feeling your heart rate beat really fast and mm-hmm. having those special days and coming home when you're pissed off and you didn't get the results that you wanted or coming home like feeling like you are the happiest man in the world for an hour because you won a game or you, you had your swimmers swimming fast at a competition or qualifying for the Olympics or World Championships. Or last year, we, we had two girls uh, getting a medal at World Championships, two silver medal at World Championships. Uh, and, and, and you feel like although you, you're not helping very much, you still get that. You, you right. take away that, that, that part and say, hey, I'm part of this, you know, because I, I go to work every day and I work hard to help them and to make sure that they get all the conditions that they need to perform. So I, I do it at a different level, and it's also a different stage of my life. But uh, And there's not too many gigs. Uh, I, I, I love a career at the end, like like David Marsh, you know, going back to a, a, a special place and, and working with special athletes, with special staff and everything. But you don't find so many positions like this in, um, in France, right. you know? Right. Uh, so it, it's it's different organization and... It, for sure, we don't have that level. I, I don't have the luxury, uh, although I miss a lot of things, especially talking to you tonight about uh, swimming. You know, it, it, it flows in the way. chlorine is in my is in my blood. But yeah. uh, but I, I, I'm really happy uh, trying to uh, trying to test uh, knowledge and material when it's even in a shorter amount of time or when you have to help athletes perform right you know? right yeah uh because all we do as coaches is just share words to an athlete so either to te- to tell them what they're going to do in a workout or to tell them how to do it or to tell them to how to go over some some kind of emotions or to tell them what they do right and what they do wrong we don't do more than that and you can do it in many different ways and you can be part of the performance you can be in the front line you can be in the middle line you can be in the back line I'm in the back line, but I'm in many different back lines. So I get many different kind of emotions. Uh, and for now, it's fulfilling. So I'm not asking too much and, and um, too much more than what I'm getting right now. I'm getting um, not so grateful athletes being pissed off when they don't do well and forgetting to say, <laughs> say thank you when they do well. And this is pretty much all you can expect as a coach, you know, yeah. seeing him perform and not caring about you seeing him not perform and saying that it's all your fault, you know, Uh, (laughs) this is the job of a a coach, but this is why probably why we like it so much. Yeah. It's hard work, isn't it? Um, A couple of other things. What about, what about this platform? You know, the the thing that I've done here where I've, where I've the past three years, just uh, bringing people together and sharing stories. Do you like it? It's impressive. Uh, I knew you had that, but uh, it's actually to an even better level Like the preparation the atmosphere and the fact that uh, the fact that it, it allows uh, people, you know, to uh, to get a sense of what's going on. You know, you can learn, you can enjoy, you can question yourself. Uh, it has yeah. pretty much everything in it, uh, it, 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 and and you can take it anywhere with you, and, and yeah. it's good. And uh, for sure, it's difficult for me because we are so familiar. You and me, it's different. But uh, I've watched when it is, uh, and, and and you know a lot of people. But there's also people that that you you, you know them, but not as well. And and, yeah. and and it's always the same level of professionalism, and it's always so interesting. And 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 the quality of the people that you can have, you know, there's yeah. not many people in the world of swimming that can attract the way you did uh and the quality you know and 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 it's really 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 hard things to do because uh you and i have been in this game of swimming for a few years now Uh, the economy of swimming is not always easy and 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 performing to a level that it's uh it's sustainable it's a it's a really big challenge it's it yeah and and uh and it's good and it's 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 an essential tool this platform well, is, you know, it's it, yeah. I, I've I've started to appreciate that more and more, with just with the feedback that I get. You know, like I'll, I'll have I'll have 
Jocko. Jocko will, will, you know, put a comment up. I'm like, wow, Jocko, what's that? You know, so it's like you, you just you start to realize the impact that you have on world swimming when when I'm just sitting here having conversations with with people. But, you know, uh, I guess, again, it, it comes down to a, a little bit of luck. Like I started this thing and it was kind of going nowhere for a little while. And then I just remember calling up my buddy, Michael Clem, and I was like, hey, Michael, will you, will you do this podcast for me? He's like, yeah, man, of course. And so it was like that was kind of the catalyst. And then it was like Michael led to Grant Hackett and Grant Hackett led to Ian Thorpe and then Ian Thorpe led to pop off. And then all of a sudden you're, you're starting to have these conversations with the world's greatest swimmers and coaches and, and, uh, and it is what it is. So I, I'm, I'm really um, thankful for this because what it's done again, like you is like, I, I, it burned me out. Like I got to the point of, of 40 something too. And I was like, I'm, I'm burned hard and I, I need to remove myself from this, but I love swimming and I want to stay connected to it but I, I can't be on the pool deck and dealing with this situation where I'm putting my heart and soul into this and not, not getting as much out of it as I want kind of thing, you know? So this has allowed me to stay connected to it, you know? And it's really important because you and I, I think we, we live by the connection with swimming and it, mm. it makes us happy. It's a, it's a, yeah. it's a special place when I know that when I talk to a swimmer, when I talk to a swim coach, my day is a good day. You yeah, know, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we we just hosted uh, in March, end of March, the Marseille Open Mediterranean, which is a good competition. We used to have Anthony Irving, Natalie Coglin, uh, mm. um, Nathan Adrian, many people coming from all around the world. And there was still some really good swimmers there. So I meet some old friends or coaches yeah. and everything. And yeah. I spent three days and, and I sit down and it, it, it's better than going out to a bar and yeah. talking to your friends. You know, it, it just makes you feel good. Swimming does that to you. Yeah. Uh, and for sure, it, it's remarkable what, uh, what you've, you've, you've accomplished. And I think it's just the beginning now because like people, people, really, people that are interested in improving will turn more and more to this kind of format and, and, so. yeah. and to the people. And, 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 it, and it's not me. It's the quality of what you ask me. Of course, we... I'm sure some people will think, okay, those two two old guys trying to talk about twenty some years ago, a little, little small place from Alabama. But I think it wasn't all that, or only that. It was also answering, uh, in all fairness, to some question about like, you know, when you have not been the best as a swimmer, how can you right. turn out to be a better coach? Yeah, yeah. It has it has been an answering question about individual yeah. team. It has been question about reinventing yourself at some point because right. every great champion that one one day reinvent themselves. And, and, you, and you, the, the atmosphere that you create is, is low key, but at the same time is centered. Mm -hmm. At least from what I what I watched and what I felt tonight was really that. And the other thing yeah. is that you and I did that that goes overlooked. It gets overlooked sometimes. That I think is an absolutely necessary part of success is you embrace the culture of where you're at. And so you and I had to embrace America. You know, there are things that you absolutely love about France. There are things that I absolutely love about Australia that we kind of had to just put on the back burner for a while and say like that, that's not going to be part of our life right now. We're, we're in the American culture. And not only that, we're in the deep South. We're in Alabama, you know, like redneck land. We had to really embrace the culture, you know, I had to drive an Impala 1973 in the middle of the night, not knowing how to turn on the lights. And I got arrested for that because the lights were at the right next to the pedals where you accelerate and stop. And I had never known that. And I had friends that, you know, only I, you and I could understand because they live next to us. But even yeah. people from Alabama didn't yeah. understand them. I mean, it's a. Uh, when, when you choose to change, you really have to embrace. And it, it, yeah. it's even more true. To the, to the culture of the team that you go in. You know, yeah, I, I faced yeah. it sometimes. I've had athletes, great, talented athletes, yeah. really good people. I will not name them. World record holder came into yeah. Marseille sometimes. That did not match yeah. because they came in to take and not to, right. to understand what was going on. Right, right. A, team, a team only function, functions well when, when you, you put as much fuel as you take and ideally mm -hmm. you put a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And it's just the, the, the team energy that will carry you. Mm -hmm. Everybody is here to bring uh, fire to the wood to the fire, yeah. and this great fire will keep you warm at night. You mm -hmm. know, but uh, but you have to do your part, and uh, yeah, and 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 it happens in a lot of places now, and and a lot of coaches have understood it, and and uh, this kind of uh, initiative, like what you do, helps a lot of people understand that uh, coaching a team is a way to do. It. Yeah. Um, 
I, I, I know that behind every very big successful story, there's at least five to 10 swimmers in the, in, in the, that people don't know about that were there on a the day. Oh, yeah. I've got a, a, yeah. a quick story of a, a name, a young guy's, uh, that, that, that's, uh, that's name, uh, Axel, that was, that was part of our team in Marseille. No one knows about it, but one day he had a big talk to Florent in the middle of a training by saying, if only I had like one-tenth of your talent, the career that I would do, Laurent, sorry, it was an Axel, it was Laurent Arnaud, uh, with just 10% of your talent, my career would be so much bigger than yours. Mm. The minute he said that, uh, Florent can, can turned out from a, a negative spiral, a ne negative cycle that he was in, and mm. in seven weeks ended up winning four medals at world championships and beating two world records, one in backstroke, which is an mm. event that he never swam. And th the turning point came from one of his teammates that actually shook mm. him and said, wake up, mm. you know, start mm. doing the right thing now and start changing. And right. he came from the swimmers and, and Tim is magical for that. And I yeah. encourage everyone watching us to try to understand the, the, the hidden, the small signals mechanism that you know support mm. uh, team energy that can take any swimmer to a bigger level that uh, what you do at the individual level yeah especially in the long term um i've been one of the very few people in history that have been lucky to be part of the home team for an olympics twice i was part of the sydney olympics uh for australia obviously and then i was part of the rio brazilian uh team in rio in, in 16 so i've seen it firsthand how how do you think the French team will do next year? And what, what, like, what, do you, what kind of advice would you give these athletes in order to have success? You think? I think we have this thing called a uh, national agency for sport that was created three, four years ago. And the head of that is named Claude Donesta. He's a former handball coaches that won two times the Olympics. Very smart mind, uh, brilliant for any kind of sport that can help from swimming to any sport because he understands the mechanism of high level and he understands the dynamic of teams and is in charge of that. And they've addressed, they, they, they've addressed the right thing. They call, they, they talk about the home advantage, but I think, you know, in a good way, not in the way that that can actually turn against them. Like because you're at home, you expect that it's, mm. it's harder to win at home. Yeah. I think they've addressed the fact that there will be more pressure. Right. right. Um, and that Tons they, 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 it's, it's, it's tough. When, when I walked yeah. out in Sydney, I couldn't feel my face, Romy. My face was numb, completely numb. When I walked for sure. out for the final of the the, 50, the semi final, the fifty three. Well, that, that's because numb. the Australian, they, the, the Australian, they did it wrong. They, they did what they did stands only on one side, and the stands oh. was so big that it was a football stadium. So, so all of a sudden, you come in and you've never prepared ninety nine percent of the yeah, of the yeah. athletes for that. Yeah. It was too tall, you know. Yeah. You, you came was... in like it. You, you, you thought you had to play soccer, not, uh, not swimming. <laughs> it was crazy. But it was crazy. And and and, and the Aussies fan were just crazy also yeah. in, in terms of energy for sure. So the home advantage can play against you, play with you. Uh, they, they, they're doing a lot of meetings. They, they started what is well known in the U.S., in, in England, in Australia, probably the coaching program, which we never had before. Uh, we never had this thing where you coaching where you're coaching the coaches. You know, people mm -hmm. in France are now expected that those coaches had the special power, that the coaches, they know everything. So what did the coaches do? Mm -hmm. But they actually created special um, mission and, 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 and give, them, give them all the tools to address some of the difficulty. They learn from London. Mm -hmm. They learn from Sydney. They learn from Rio, uh, especially from London in 2012, because uh, it's not too far away from us. And, and English people did a lot of material about it in the preparation and everything and and also we do it with our french side of things you know we have way to do things that are very unique a french kiss uh, and a french toast is different mm. than any other kiss or toast so well, they, they will add to that they will add to some of the successful parts that we know how to do you know french people can be um against the rule most of the time but that can be really useful in the middle of a crisis because it's it's not, you know, it's, mm. it's not thinking like uh, the competition can sometimes. We realize that could be really useful for the French relay in some part. We played against our own rules sometimes, but in the French way. And that really helped us to beat the U.S. team that sometimes was better than us in relays. We did it the way we were. Uh, and, and actually, it can be very useful. It's, it's a really messy the French organization. 
But when everything gets messy because high level, it comes sometimes get messy. It's very unpredictable. Sometimes mm. messy in unpredictable times can be better than very accurate. When yeah. things get, you know, when things yeah. change at the last seconds, you freak out. French people don't right. freak out because they're used to the mess. Um, <laughs> but uh, but the home advantage uh, would be to understand that there will be more pressure and to prepare oh, sure. according to, uh, prepared according to the circumstances, <laughs> and maybe to just face this kind of pressure that you think, okay, it's not that big and, and now I can, I can perform really well, but yeah. there will be massive amount of expectation on the people that can medal. And I'm thinking about massive. one kid in France for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Huge yeah. expectations. And uh, you know, the advice that I will give, I saw, I saw, I felt it as an athlete and I saw it as a coach in, in 16 and with, with, with a guy like Bruno, uh, Bruno had a very similar mindset that, that I had in 2000 and even as a coach, uh, it was almost like a train wreck. I could see, I could see it happening, you know, and I and I couldn't stop. And you it. can't stop it. You I couldn't stop, stop it. it. I couldn't stop it. And and what I what I would say to Bruno, and if Bruno's listened to this, I, I may have told him this. But Bruno wanted to win so much for his country, and it was very similar to me. I wanted to win for Australia because it was it was it was in my hometown. I'm like the Olympic pool was 10 minutes from where I grew up. It's like growing up in Marseille and then walking, walking down the road and jumping in the Olympic pool and competing at the Olympics. It's like, that was my home Olympics. So everybody that I'd ever touched in my life, my, my teachers, my friends, my, you know, anybody that ever knew me had the expectation that I was going to win. And I, and I needed to win for Australia. Like it was always like, you're going to win for Australia. And I could see that in Bruno. You're going to win for Brazil. You know, he wanted, he had so much pride in his country that it becomes too big. It's too much. You can't win for a country. You know, you can, you can win uh, a, a particular race when you focus on the pool about swimming up and down the pool like any other pool. But when you take on a, a country and try and win for millions of people, it's, it, I found it was too much. And I found that Bruno had a very similar experience where it was just overwhelmingly too much, you know? I, I, I want to share a story based on what you just said. And I, I, I agree. And in 2012, Laurent won the Olympics in the 50 freestyle. Mm -hmm. And uh, one, one, one of the first questions I asked him was, Laurent, how did you do it? He looked at me like, why do you ask me? He didn't say it, but I could say in his eyes, why do you ask me this question this very moment? Who cares? But because I asked the question, he was polite enough to answer. And he said, I just tried to turn on the lights. Mm -hmm. 2012 was the time they established this new technology on the blocks that we now all know, all know about. Is They put lights on the side of the blocks. And when you were first, you had one light, second, two lights, third, three lights. We all watched it. But it wasn't for the coaches or the athletes. It was for the spectators. It was for the TV. We all knew what it meant. Uh, but we didn't really care. And it, the whole week, he watched it, but didn't really pay attention to that. When he dove for the final of the Olympics, he, after the breakout, he realized I'm going to turn on the lights in my block. And he wasn't swimming in the Olympic final. Yeah, he was yeah. swimming like a kid trying yeah. to achieve a dream yeah. that became just a red light, a small red light. And when yeah. everybody else was swimming for pressure, uh -huh. like Caesar probably because he's trying to win back to back, uh -huh. Juan was playing. And you cannot win if, the, if the, the competition is the same level of you as you. And if yeah. you, you talk about sprinting, Mm -hmm. The key is relaxation. relaxation. The key is flow. Yeah. You know, not flow, but flow, the flow. And if you have the flow and if you stay relaxed. Look at Anthony Irvin in 16. Who, who expected him to win 16 years later? Because he wasn't swimming to win. He yeah. was actually in the moment. It was like that special thing where he was like, you know, if it's destined to happen, it's destined to happen. But I, I so want, it was all this paradoxes like this uh, yeah things where yeah. you want to win but you know it might not happen you want to be happy but you know you might not be and you, you put all this and you put yourself right in the middle of it right at the sweet yeah. spot the yeah. perfect spot you right. know you've got an incredible amount of speed because you took out the four by 100 freestyle in the morning at 21 six to your feet you yeah. know it's possible but you know it's not going to happen you you know that Florent is a little bit faster than you, but you know that if you're more relaxed than him, you can beat him. All this. You know you have a worse start, but you know you'll finish better. And you yeah. put yourself right in the middle. And you put your, yourself in the right position to win. Yeah. And it's like that. Mm -hmm. You know? Quick story also on this. Uh, Florent won the Olympics. And it was, it was um, the first event that he has ever won at the senior level. He's never been French champion before that. 
never been European champion, never been world champion. The first competition that he won was the Olympics game, the Olympic Games. And I want to share wow. a story about James Gibson that was brilliant that day. James Gibson, assistant coach at the time, but also full-time coach. I don't understand what assistant is when you, you know, help. Yeah. You don't assist. You know, you take a part in your own performance. Or yeah. You help the swimmer. And James starts smacking Florent on the chest really strong several times. It's 20 minutes after the race. And Florent already had a, a stupid question from his coach. How did you do it? Who cares? <laughs> and he was getting smacked on the chest by, uh, by James several times to the point that he came down from his uh, Olympic mountain, came down from his clouds where he was happy. And he looked at James and said, it's painful. Why are you doing this? He goes, because I want you to listen to me. You put in the middle of that uh, shirt, you put the biggest star, Olympic champion. Now let's win the two smallest stars that European side, European short course, European long course. And let's put the two world stars, world short course and world long course. And you will have the, the four stars. And this is the grand slam. And you become someone. And he smacked him again really hard. And I could see that that day, he replaced the dream of becoming an Olympic champion by a new quest. Mm. So when you play, but you have a dream, you have a chance to succeed. Wow. You know, and I believe that people that won, they really were at the sweet spot with a massive dream. And, and they, they just find the perfect connection. And the story that you were saying about Bruno was his dreams were bigger than the reality sometimes. Yeah. This is probably why we love Bruno and why he's so successful. Yeah. Because he's, he's this guy that dreams more than anyone else and he's got an awful lot yeah. of talent. But sometimes his talents was impeded. Impeded? You said yeah. Was mm -hmm. Impeded mm -hmm. by his willingness to succeed that was bigger and actually added pressure for nothing. Where we all know that what Bruno needs is to be relaxed because he swims so fast, the second 25. And if he wants it too much, then he doesn't swim as fast. And because he doesn't have the best start in the world, then he doesn't win. But if he's actually close enough and he's relaxed, then he will win. Yeah. And, and, and that sometimes it's just not possible to tell swimmers stop dream less because yeah. it's actually it's the toughest thing to do to a, a, an athlete to say, please dream more. Yeah. So when you have a guy that dreams mm -hmm. every day that comes to, mm -hmm. comes to you and say, I want to become the best mm -hmm. every single day, whether it mm -hmm. rains, it snows, it's cold. Mm -hmm. It's the Bruno guy, you know, the Bruno yeah. guy is the special kind. You know, every time yeah. I, I hear him speak, I wish I was, I had him on my team and saying like, okay, Bruno, yeah. tell your teammates how it's done, you know, but uh, he's, he's this guy that, uh, that I um, respect so much for, uh, for his willingness to succeed beyond anything else. He's probably one of the, the athletes that you, you meet on deck and you can feel it from meters away, from yards away from the U.S. guys. You can feel his urge to succeed so many times he wants it. Yeah, yeah. I actually have a, I have a Bruno story that um, is very dear to me that I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't share publicly, but I'll, I'll tell you when we, when we turn this off. Uh, I'll, tell, I'll tell you, he's, just a, he's very special to me, Bruno, very special. And, and exactly, you summed it up perfectly there, but... Um, you know that that guy would uh, would bleed for his country. I have no doubt about it. You know he would bleed for his country, but he would he would bleed for any team that he was part of too. He he would bleed for me. I, I believe that. You know he's just one of these guys that if he if he believes in you, you believe in him. He's going to give you everything a hundred percent, no doubt, nothing. Um, but uh, let me favorite. It was my favorite on deck because years yeah. after years, you see him in it. Uh, is one of those things that as a coach, the amount of respect that he gives you, whether you're coaching his competition or you coach or you're a friend of one of his coaches or you're just a, a good relationship, it, yeah. it, it's something special. You know, yeah. you don't meet so many people like that. And, uh, he's a good man. He's, he, and he, there, loves, he's good man. He, he loves flow too. He's just a fan of swimming too. You know, he's a fan of, he's a fan of high performers too. Like if he, if he meets somebody with the same mentality, he's going to appreciate that person. Like he, he loves Anthony Irvin. He loves... Nathan Adrian, he loves flow manager. Like he, he loves these guys, you know, like sometimes you hate your competition, but this guy loves his competition because they make him better, you know? But they, if I had to choose between two champions, I would always prefer the champion that loves the competition rather than the one that yeah. just uses it as a power or as a, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's why, I, that's why the I ideal that. champion would be more like a uh, Bruno than, uh, yeah. than someone that hates his competition yeah, to me. Exactly. Um, speaking of champions and speaking of French Olympics, um, do you think Flo can win again? Can, can he actually win next year? I don't know. Um, I think Flo 
uh, will always perform better at the Olympics than at any other competition on earth at any moment in time. For some reason, he has this thing that I hope that uh, some coaches understand. The Olympics is a special place. It's very different than any other competition that you will face for many different reasons. From the many distractions that you get when you're at the village, from the fact that it's people think of it as something so special that it becomes a symbol more than a competition. But Florent is there like you, you're there at, at Disneyland for him. You know, he's, he's, he goes back to um, the minute you step in the Olympic Village, hmm. he's happy and he's happy for the whole time that he's there. Hmm. And his happiness uh, brings him energy. It doesn't take energy. It's not distraction that takes energy away from him. It's actually mm -hmm. things that bring him. So if he, he was there in 2012, did better than expected. In 2016, it was a little bit difficult, but still performed pretty well. Uh, it wasn't attached to any dreams. He was he came after the race, told me he was happy because he was Anthony. For a guy that hated losing so much, it mm -hmm. didn't make sense, but still got a medal. In 2021, for sure, he wasn't at the level two weeks before, or even probably two days before the competition to get the level. And I've never seen in three Olympics flow not perform well at the Olympics. And I mm -hmm. saw it from the very first second we stepped on the Olympic Village in London. His face was different. He looked mm -hmm. at me, he goes, mm -hmm. this is where I belong. A lot of people prefer, prepare for the Olympics and they destroy themselves from the moment they stepped into the village until they race. He's the kind of guy that comes into a level before the when he steps in the Olympic Village, it keeps improving every day. And that's really, if, if people get the chance to ask him, why is that? What does he do? What's his secret? Because if you want to become an Olympic champion, the seven days before is key to success. You can, mm. you cannot get to the level, but you can actually destroy, destroy a lot of the things that you've done for four years in, in, yeah. in one week. You know, yeah. it happens very yeah. quickly. The conditions are not what people, people that haven't been there, they, they don't understand. Like the, the conditions are not what we usually have. The village is not comfort. No. You, it's difficult to, to, to get to a lot of places. It's a lot of time wasted. It's, 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 it's tough to find the normal food. And it's a lot of distraction. When you yeah. see the Muhammad Ali walk in uh, the yeah. village and all of a sudden you lose your attention for 20 minutes and everything. And, yeah. And also for, for swimmers, sometimes it's not easy to face so many basketball players or handball players or volleyball players at like seven feet tall, or the women yeah. that are seven, seven feet tall, way taller than you and everything. Yeah. Your ego is bruised many, many times when <laughs> yeah. you get to that village. But Florent is, um, is just, it just takes the Olympics for what it is. One special, unique opportunity where all the best athletes in the world are together to enjoy a special moment and a special performance. The key to success to French team to 2024, you know, we talked about, you know, it, it's not actually, and you said it, whether it's your hometown or not, you only win a race if you forget everything around, everything around except your own lane line. Forget the pressure. The, the pressure is good enough to create some adrenaline a little bit before the race, mixed with fear and everything to create that amount. But then it has to be regulated through your body to create performance. Now that you know that not feeling uh, your, your whole face before the race is not a state to swim actually really good. It's too much. It's like it's, it wasn't controlled enough so you can get to the right amount of adrenaline that will push your performance, you know? Sometimes you can perform really well like that. But a story from Reich Nisling telling me in 2004 in Athens that when he was anchoring the relay, the hardest part of his relay was to actually step on the block because his legs were shaking so yeah. much that he felt like he was fall. Once he dove, it was okay. But that, that, that there was some parts, some elements yeah. in the construction of the performance that, that, that were not done correctly with the sports psychologist or your right. own, your own like uh, preparation to the performance. You know, yeah. I think it's key. I mean, we know that the best swimmers, uh, they, 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 they can feel special emotions. They, they can feel their faces. They can step on the blocks, you know. And, and they learn how to deal with that kind of emotion and, and transform it at the right moment to come, up, to come out on deck and have their own routine and everything. Who is the better Manadu? Law Manadu or Flow Manadu? Who, who, who has the, who, who has the especially, most talent? Especially for you, but um, difficult, difficult battle because I do not think that we have never seen 100% from each one of them. That's what I, I think, think too. I think the same thing. There, there, there is, I think there was there was so much talent in these two. So much if, talent. If I had a feeling that both of them would have been 
closer to 100%, then you could compare. I think Laura right. had so much more in her in, in many different aspects. Yeah. But uh, easy to say, you know, but uh, with, with all that she's accomplished, maybe, you know, maybe she, she will believe I'm wrong. But I guarantee from what I saw and from my outside perspective, mm. from some part of a success, from my inside perspective, right after the biggest part of a success, when she was in Marseille and I coached her for a couple of years, uh, the, the, some days you would see things that is just not human, extraterrestrial. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, uh, and, and they've, the, the parents have designed two monsters in, in terms of talent. And, and Florent, and, and, and Florent I, I, one of the regrets that I have in my career was to see the construction of a, the best performance that Florent could accomplish in 100 freestyle if one time he had put long mm. enough preparation. Mm. He had, you know, yeah. Maybe his body was not made for it. Yeah. I believe that if he didn't decide to do it, it's because like he's, he, he believed that maybe he would interfere with his 50-meter performance. Right. You know? right. And uh, I was never good enough, smart enough to convince him. But uh, I know that one day, of course, now it's, it might look a little bit different with guys going 46 and everything. But at the time, I think Florent could have like uh, shocked the world with a great performance in a hundred freestyle at some point. And there was there was yeah. every element in him uh, with the amount of speed that he had, and from what I've seen, that he could not do an amazing second fifty. I mean, he yeah, had everything. Yeah. Just we never really put it together. He's some forty-seven one time, forty-seven nine long course. But I think it's far, far, far away from what he could really have accomplished. When I said he's not happy. Uh, because he doesn't like to say that he doesn't he never u utilize 100% of his full talent. But from my outside perspective, I truly believe that uh, he had more in him. I mean, so yeah. Did yeah, yeah, no, I, th I think so too. I mean, I, I, I've heard that. I've, I've seen a little bit of that. I, I've, and it's crazy to say that about two Olympic champions, you know. But the the, the amount of talent is just astronomical, you know, just astronomical. Like, freaky but um we had a uh, we had we had this guy back back in the days also that always shocked me with his amount of talent was his name amory levo mm. some time he was the world record holder in short horse yeah and the kid was just a freak and uh, mm. the amount of talent the things that yeah. i've seen do in in training and i was coaching some great swimmers but um they were sometimes even beating him in competition and the difference in in potential in raw 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 talent was so big that I could not understand, and I was I felt happy that he was an, actually uh, using it because he was he was a, a weapon if he did. But uh, we we had a time where we had these this special special guys in the team that were amazing, and they, they all did great. But I believe they could have done even even more. If if Leon does what we think he can do next year in terms of his his talent and abilities, and and he goes on to win. A number of uh, events in Paris. Do, does he become a superstar in in Paris? Is is swimming? I mean, in in, uh, in France, do, is swimming that big still, or is it is it uh, being superseded by other sports like soccer and things? But like, does he become a superstar in France? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think nothing has changed. Um, swimming holds a special place in the in the subconscious mind of the French people. And when someone doesn't matter when someone comes, it was they, everybody. What Lord did, followed by Alain Bernard, yeah. followed by uh, Camille Lacour, followed by Maurice Levo, by Fabien Gillot, by Fred Bousquet. It's the generation of people still know, you know, and and and, and they really helped uh, uh, the amount of uh, of um, famousness that uh, Lyon already has. Doing nothing, we don't see him on very very few moments. He's really in the right place at the moment, training in the U.S., away from the pressure. And right, everything. Right. He's really making a lot of smart decisions, one after another, uh, to prevent from all this uh, fuzziness, excitement that could take him away from, from what he can accomplish beyond the number of medals or anything. Like, I think he's in, in the right place because like, he, he's thinking like uh, the raw performance, like, the, uh, like, uh, like art, not like actually scientific or times or things like that but he talks about uh, happiness and connection and mm. and gliding and accelerating and being in the water and popping mm. out and all those things and he's thinking he's 400 i am i saw i saw an interview that i i, I 
he, he said something abso- uh, like absolutely brilliant. He said, like, I stopped watching Michael Phelps races the day I got to Arizona. The day he stopped watching his idol, he stopped having a chance to beat him. Uh-huh. And um, he um, he's actually, by the fact that his scarcity sometimes creates famousness. And he's scarce mm-hmm. at the moment. Yeah, it's tough yeah. on you, but I think it's tough on a lot of people. Yeah. It's, tough, it's tough in France to, to get, and, and it's very, very few moments. So uh, a lot of people are talking to me about it. Of course, I'm inside the community, but a lot of people are questioning, who's this kid? Can you tell me a bit more? And, and it's just creating, uh, creating the buzz before even the perform, obviously, an amazing talent. But yeah. 2024, whoever will get gold medal will become famous. We get, whoever gets two become really famous. And whoever got gold medal that was you know, really uh, almost doomed to become gold medal, yeah, uh, and, he, and he has it all to become a superstar. You know, he has the smile, he has the right words, he has this. We, you and I know it. You, you know, winning the 400 IM is probably one of the toughest events in all sports, all across sports in the world. You know, it's such a tough event. You win it. You know, people want to understand what kind of material you made of. And he has this thing that he looks like a, a nice kid, but he's so tough on the inside. Yeah, that people will for sure, uh, and he's a lovable kind of kid, you know, and his answers are always right. And he, he uh, we were talking about Bruno before, but I'm sure, like, uh, from the amount of what uh, the people that I that I hear from, you know, he's, he's a nice kid. And, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, I've heard the same things. He's a very so, nice kid, you know. Uh, it, it reminds me where he is <laughs> and the situation he's going into, it reminds me so much of Ian Thorpe in 1999. And the build up and where he was and the expectation. And I remember this, and you probably you probably remember this too, but like standing on the pool deck on night one of of the Sydney Olympics, and he 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 has he's got to swim the relay later. His first event is that 400 free. And the whole world just stops dead for a second. And this young kid walks up and stands behind the block. He's got this black suit on. Every single person in the stadium is expecting him to go out and win this race for them. And this guy just this guy just takes a bowl of cereal and just eats it like pressure. Just eats it, you know, like the pressure. It was like, I mean, I, I never felt pressure. I felt I was like so uncomfortable standing on the pool deck watching this young kid. And he just so relaxed. And he just stood up on the block. He wiped his feet and then boom, he goes in and just does his thing. Like it was the most glorious, beautiful thing I've ever seen. He wins this 400 free by 25 meters. Practically. It's like complete domination. I'm like, that is eating pressure, you know? And because I think he, he wasn't doing the same sport as the competition. He was, he was, uh, one, his, yeah. ca- his, his catch was different. His yeah. turns coming out, the turns, his legs were different. He had an engine behind that. Oh, that's where really Leon wanted. is, man. He's, he's, he's like that right now. Exactly. And, and he has one and a half years, one and a half year to sharpen the tools and to get to that state of mind. Uh, easy to say, probably hard to do. That means oh, yeah. a lot of pain, a lot of painful sets ahead, yeah. a lot of smart decisions to make, uh, and a lot of calmness in the highest mm-hmm. moment. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you know it, and I know it. Like world championship will not be an easy stage one year before the Olympics. People already expect you to repeat what you did because there's there's, yeah. there's world championships all around the corner every two weeks now. Yeah. So you you have to put again um, all your all your expectations on the table in front of the whole world, and there will be pressure. And uh, but he he's doing his own thing at the moment. You know he's he's, yeah. he's training with some of the best guys in the world and. and mm. And he's doing his own thing and he's doing, he's taking swimming to natural state, not competition, but he's doing his, he's, he's competing against, against the element, against himself with the competition. And he's doing it in a different way. And, and for now he's, he hasn't made any mistakes. And I, and I, I hope so hard that he doesn't make it that we see something special because then French people could feel what Australia felt when, uh, it's actually, a, a, you understand it's a part of you that's swimming. It's the best part of you, even for the non-swimmers. It's the part of who you want to be. You want to be this guy that can win the hardest races in front of the camera and in front of the, the whole country. Yeah. And, and, and he's show, showing you the best of what, uh, the link that we all have as French people, that you had as Australian people. And he's that guy, he's, he's the French guy. 
you know, uh, his book is becoming because of scarcity, because of his performances, because of his smile, because of his uh, uh, relaxed attitude all the time. He's becoming actually what we want to be as French people. We want to be serious, but not taking things seriously. Yeah. We want to be doing things hard, but we want to pretend it's not. We want to smile and be respectful, but we also want to joke and make fun, but not to hurt, but just to have fun because life is already tough as it is, yeah. you know. And he, and he's, he's, he's actually uh, being this this guy, you know, um, tough guy that can smile when he gets tougher. And I I yeah. believe that uh, I believe that uh, that we all we all wish we were a little bit like Leon. Mm-hmm. And, and, yeah. and if that if that builds up, I want to be like Leon. Then you'll have whole France behind him. Yeah. And if he actually wins, it will become a superstar for sure. Yeah, yeah, I don't doubt it. Is there anyone else that we don't know about that we need to know about before Paris in in France? Uh, Johan, he's a good kid, backstroker. He was European champion last year, one fifty five. I believe he has a lot more in the tank. He's a raw talent. Uh, he can become better. Max Gosset, the sprinter, can be really good. Mm-hmm. Uh, Max is Max was uh, second at world championships and he's becoming really like Bruno in the 50. He's becoming really um swimming always at a good level. Yeah, you who know, coaches him? Uh, Michel Chrétien from INSEP. Michel was the former coach of Jeremy Stravus, oh, okay, right. good experience coach. So yeah. Maxime Grosset is good and he's also coaching Johan and Doy. Those two guys can be good. Marie Vatel was second at world championships. We coach her. She, she can be really good, big potential, strong girl, tall. Mm. Uh, she has more in her, and I think she can drop down sometimes. She was sixth at the Olympics in 2021, second after the semifinal. I think she learned from that experience that she can be dangerous. A couple of relays, I think, can be good, especially with Leon in the 4 by 2 We have this uh, we have this kid from Toulouse also that's uh, from 145, long course. We have a couple guy at 146, flat start, one guy 145, and Leon. If uh, uh, we know how to do the chemistry in relay, so relay can yeah. be good. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure I'm following. I'm, I'm forgetting a couple of a couple guys, but especially um, if if I'm not wrong, and the program is the same with the 400 IM being the first day. Uh, if that's the case, and 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 we have this uh, dynamic boost from a uh, from our a leader, uh, yeah. you know, it changes everything. Yeah, when, yeah. when you start when you start putting the the the, the winning. Mm-hmm. Uh, attitude uh, at the Olympics it changes everything yeah. you know yeah, you become, sure, when sure. you start becoming at par with the competition or even stronger than the competition you know magical things happen and yeah. this is very it's really an environment that's depending on the dynamic of things and and the fact that you have one guy that's uh, that big will protect everyone it will make you will make the whole team better just by his aura and his charisma mm-hmm. yeah are you going to be standing well, I, on the pool deck in Paris? I don't know. Uh, probably not. Uh, probably in the stands or uh, not far away because uh, my family I have half my family living in Paris now on mm-hmm. my wife's side. So for sure I will uh, find a couch to, to slip in and be sneaking around and, um, and, and watching and, and for sure like uh, enjoying it <clears throat> because it, it's special. You know, you, yeah, you've yeah. lived it. It's yeah, special, yeah. So yeah, I'm excited. Special about a home home Olympics, man. It's nothing like it, you know. It's just... Nothing like it. It turns around, it, and we really need it because we 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 way back in in terms of our culture. So much national pride. It gives you so much pride. I remember just walking around feeling the sense of like real national pride. You know. Yeah. Yeah. We are we are really good with culture, with movie, with music, with arts, books, and everything. And yeah. we don't re- you're not so good with sports, like. Uh, budget for sports is nothing compared to the cultural budget. Mm. I'm sure, it doesn't att- it doesn't attract tourists, but uh, I hope that it will change the mindset of a few people in this yeah. world. Of our, you know, we, we need to have you know champions and, and symbols yeah. and, and icons to look for for the kids. So, yeah. I truly hope that the French team will perform really well, and I truly hope that uh, we get a lot of medals because uh, the French guy, just like anybody else around the world, they train hard for it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, this has been fun, man. I've enjoyed catching up again. It's good to see you. Me too. It's time yeah. for me to go to bed. It's uh, it's midnight in France. Oh, shit. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> That's okay. Waking up in a couple hours for the kids and again early in the morning. But it was oh, it was God. a great pleasure, Brad. I really, really enjoyed it. I hope uh, 
people that watch us, you know. Yeah. I uh, enjoyed it too. And it, it really was a good moment. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. Good to see you again. All right. Take care, bud. Good to see you. See you, man.